أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى ومن يقترف حسنة حسنة نزد له فيها حسنا إن الله غفور شكور My dear viewers, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته On the occasion of the birthday of the fourth member of أصحاب الكساء الإمام الحسن عليه السلام I see th I seize this great opportunity to congratulate all of you as well as the entire Islamic nation for such ha happy and joyous occasion. Also, we take the opportunity to learn from this great Imam legacy, instruction and teachings. The humanity today is in dire need of his wonderful legacy that he has left. In tonight's discussion, I will be alluding to some references in the Holy Quran where there are some verses were revealed, were revealed in occasion and in reference to the great Imam, Al-Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. The reason is that we are instructed by the Almighty to emulate the prophets and the most exonerated and infallible people. Because those are the ones who will assure we will take the right path. And who is better than Al-Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam that we can emulate and follow his path. The first ayah that I will, re will be reciting is Ayat al-Mubahala. And this is in chapter Al-Imran, number 61, where the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ The cause of the descent was in relation to the incident that took place between the Prophet peace be upon him and the Christians of Najran when they came to debate the Prophet. Eventually there was no agreement reached so both decided that they would worship and supplicate to God to put his wrath against the lying party. Therefore the Almighty asked the Prophet to bring his children, his women and himself and all, narrat all narrators and historians indicate that the Prophet brought Hassan and Hussein as his children. And of course, the woman was only one, and that was Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. And he brought Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam as his soul mate. But our emphasis and focus on the children, the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, the Prophet peace be upon him is making sure revealing to the public to the companions and to the other side the adversary is that his children are Hassan and Hussein and here the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to stress on this point because Bani Umayyah throughout their history they have propagated that Hassan and Hussein were not the children of the Prophet, but the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. This is a great refute to their claim. Now we know that Quran does not emphasize on the blood relation. Blood relationship is not the important relationship. As we know that there are certain sons, offsprings, who turn to be embarrassment and shame to their parents. 
there is an incident in the Holy Quran that the Almighty reveals the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh had a child who was an embarrassment to him. When after the flood, Nuh asked the, asked the Almighty, what has happened with the fate of his son? Because the Almighty has promised him that all his offsprings and children will be saved. But when Nuh asked the, the, the Almighty about the fate of his son, the Almighty gave him this. قَالَ يَا إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكِ إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحٌ This blood relationship is not that important. He's not part of your family. He, he is a deviant person. Therefore, in the logic of Quran, a blood relationship is not that important at all. But why the Almighty here is mentioning the word Abna'ana wa abna'akum, your children and our children, emphasizing on the fact that Hassan and Hussein alayhum salam are the offsprings of the Prophet to signify this fact that Hassan and Hussein, beside being the natural children and offspring of the, pro of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they are also his natural extension. They are the ones who have inherited his legacy, his message, his holiness and sacredness, his knowledge and his infallibility. This is the take home message of Ayatul Mubahala, that Hassan and Hussein are directly connected to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and they are his true children. So, this is one reference in the Holy. Quran, where the Almighty emphasizes on the connection of Al Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam with his grandfather, peace be upon him. The second example is Ayat al Tathir, again in Surah Al Ahzab, Ayah 33, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that the household of the prophets, who are five members, are Immaculate, where it says, "Inna yuridu Allah liyudhib ankum al-ritsa ahl al-bayt wa yutahhirakum tathira." God testifies that the household of the Prophet, the title is called Ahl al-Bayt. Those individuals are venerated and exalted from any sin, from any filth of Shaytan. The followers of Ahl al-Bayt take this ayah as a, as a reference and as a proof to the fact that the household of the prophets are infallible. They are not making any mistakes. They are beyond any filth and mistake, whether physical or spiritual. This is the second reference. The third reference is Surah Al-Insan. The entire surah was revealed to the Prophet to exalt and appraise his household. And the story for which this surah was descended, that this surah descend to the Prophet, is that when Ali ibn Abi Talib, his wife Fatima al Zahra, and both of their children, Al Hassan and Hussein alayhum salam, were observing fasting. At the first day when they were observing fasting, and of course it was not during the month of Ramadan, rather it was in another occasion. At the time of Iftar, when they were supposed to break their fasting, a needy person came and knocked on the door and begged them. He was a beggar. He asked for help. They took all their foods, which consist of five pieces of a bread and gave it to the needy. And they broke their fasting with only drink of water. The next day, the same incident repeats itself. But this time, it was a captive who came and knocked on the door and asked for help. Again, they give him all their food that they had 
at their disposal. The third, and the, the third day, again, the same thing, the same scenario repeated itself, where there was an orphan who came and begged, begged the household of the Prophet for assistance. Now, let's remember, the captive who came and knocked on the door was not a Muslim. He was non-Muslim. And the, and the household of the Prophet offered him what they had. Now, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala marks this in the history of, man, of mankind and make it immortal. Where it says, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا those the three categories of people until the time that they were trembling from starvation and hunger. Ali ibn Abi Talib brought them to the Prophet. Prophet, the Prophet peace be upon him, looked at their faces that were all turned pale. He said, Ilahi, atamutu durriyatu Muhammadin min al -jur. Would the children of Muhammad will die from starvation and hunger? At that time, God sends a feast from heaven and they break their fasting on the feast from heaven. Now, that was a sacrifice. There is a difference between generosity and sacrifice. Sacrifice is an ultimate kind of generosity. Generosity is that you give, yet you don't stay in need. But sacrifice meaning that you are in dire need of that thing, yet you give it to others at the expense of yourself. And that what the household of the Prophet, peace be upon him, did that. Ali and Fatima did that consciously because they were preparing their children for their ultimate sacrifice. That was a training. If it were not, if it were not those moments, that Ali and Fatima would teach their children. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein were not able to do the ultimate sacrifice who have saved the entire humanity and the religion of God from the filth of Bani Umayyah. So that was a lesson very well learned by Hassan and Hussein. The fourth ayah, it's called Ayatul Mawadda where the Almighty mandates the love and showing of the love and affection and demonstration at its best to the household of the Prophet. Where it says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةَ This is verse number 23 of Surah Ashura. <clears throat> the Almighty make it compulsory and mandatory upon all Muslims to observe love and show their love and admiration to his household. There are a couple points that we need to allude to. Number one, whoever has fought Hassan ibn Ali and showed animosity toward him is complicit of neglecting this ayah, becoming disobedient of the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who showed hatred and animosity and involved in fighting Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib means that he became disobedient and disregarded this ayah. No matter how important is that person, no matter how much the official history glorifies that person, this person is sinful of showing hatred to Al Imam Al Hassan. The second thing, the second valuable point that we deduct from this is that those mentioned in the household are considered to be infallible. Why? Because the Almighty asks us to show our love constantly at any time to them. Now, as a Muslim, an observant Muslim, if we, someone who's, if we see someone who's disobedient to God and commits sins, we should show our resentment and disown the person and show our disgust, not our love. Meaning that the household of the Prophet 
they never make a mistake. They never make a sin. Otherwise, God would not ask, would not command us to show our love and affection to them. And the last point is that the love of Ahlul Bayt is the most important thing, the most valuable thing that anyone can imagine. Why? Because the Prophet equates that with the price of his message. He says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا I am not seeking any compensation for my message and legacy that I have brought to you, that you will be saved from the hellfire except one thing, and that's showing the love of, of, of Ahl al-Bayt. He's striking, striking an equation. On one side is salvation from hellfire and getting into the heaven. On the other side is the love of Ahl al-Bayt. Therefore, when we say that the love of Ahl al-Bayt is the most valuable thing, we have not exaggerated at all. May Allah make us all the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt. يا من إليه يهرب الخائفون يا من إليه يفزع المذنبون يا من إليه يقصد المنيبون يا من إليه يرغب الزاهدون يا من إليه يلجأ المتحيرون يا من به يستأنس المريدون يا من به يفتخر المحبون يا من في عفوه يطمع الخاطئون يا من إليه يسكن الموقنون يا من عليه يتوكل المتوكلون سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب اللهم إني أسألك باسمك يا حبيب يا طبيب يا قريب يا رقيب يا حسيب يا مهيب يا مثيب يا مجيب يا خبير يا بصير سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب يا أقرب من كل قريب يا أحب من كل حبيب يا أبصر من كل بصير يا أخبر من كل خبير يا أشرف من كل شريف يا أرفع من كل رفيع يا أقوى من كل قوي يا أغنى من كل غني يا جودا من كل جواد يا أرأف من كل رؤوف سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب Welcome back. 
with the beautiful and elegant Dua Joshan Al Kabir. We will cover segments number 43, 44, and 45. Segment number 43, the theme is to befriend, where it says, Ya man ilayhi yahrabul khaifun, Ya man ilayhi yafzaul madinun, muznibun, Ya man ilayhi yaqsudul munibun, Ya man ilayhi yarghabul sahidun, Ya man ilayhi yaljaul mutahayirun, Ya man bihi yastainisul muridun, Ya man bihi yaftakhirul muhibun, Ya man fi afuhi yatma'ul. خاطئون يا من إليه يسكن الموقنون يا من عليه يتوكل المتوكلون. The words يتوكل المتوكلون. This beautiful phrase. توكل. Reliance and trust in the Almighty Allah سبحانه وتعالى. One of the most valuable worships and means of seeking nearness to God is through Tawakkul, or reliance on the Almighty. What does that mean? It means that our hearts are sincere, that everything is at the hand of the Lord. He is the ultimate source of power. He is the ultimate source of goodness. He can change things. He can make it, makes it, he can make things in our advantage. This is meaning of tawakkul. When I have a complete faith and certainty of God's wisdom and ability to do everything in any favorable way, and second, I act upon it. This means tawakkul. Now, is there any contradiction between believing in God's ability and having tawakkul and reliance on God versus working hard or seeking the apparent causes of things? Is there a contradiction between the two? There isn't any contradiction. Someone who has full, full confidence in God and truly trusts God, at the same time, he has to seek the apparent causes to reach his own destination. If someone is in the middle of nowhere and he wants to move fast, he has to take a vehicle. He cannot say, I am relying on God. He will take me from st spot A to spot B without any means. He has to take the means. A farmer, for example, cannot say, I will stay in my home and don't go to my, don't go to my far farm. So in return, I have reliance on God. He will get me what I want. This is not tawakkul. Tawakkul is that when you work hard, when you seek the apparent causes of things, because this is how God has designed the entire system of his creation. There are divine creations, divine laws in his creations. And that divine law says that there isn't anything without an apparent cause. There must be an apparent cause. Even if that cause is so weak, so frail, unmentionable, yet you have to take the course of seeking that apparent cause. I can give you an example. Virgin Mary, when she was pregnant with her son, Isa alayhi salam, she was very weak, <clears throat> terrified, isolated, and very frail. When she took away from her community, she reached a place where there was a palm tree. Now God wanted to feed her. He didn't descend or brought down those dates, those, those fresh dates to her. Rather, he asked her to shake the tree. Well, how easy to shake a very formidable palm tree to get its fruit. It is very difficult. It's not an easy job. In fact, the farmer has to climb all the way to the top of the palm tree 
and pulled those dates down. But the Almighty asked Mary to shake it, meaning she has to take the apparent natural course of the apparent causes. Even if it's so weak, even it's just a rubber stamp, even that would not make any sense, yet she has to take it. Because God will put barakah in that thing, will make it work and become a fruitful. With a single shake, the fruit, the fresh, the fresh dates descended and came down to her. So here we have to take this natural course of things that we seek the apparent causes. We cannot stay at home and say, I am relying on God. And God would send me everything. God would not hear us, would not listen to us. What are the fruits of tawakkul? Number one, when we work hard and rely on God, number one thing that we are assured is success and victory. Here the Almighty says, إِنْ يَنْصُرْكُمُ اللَّهِ فَلَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ وَإِنْ يَخْذُلْكُمْ فَمَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلْ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ If you want to be successful, if you want to read salvation or victory, overcoming challenges, overcoming the enemy, you have to have tawakkul, total reliance on the Almighty. The second fruit of tawakkul is that you will be protected and shielded from the effect of shaitan, the evil effect, where the Almighty says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعْذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ سُلْطَانٌ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ he cannot control those who have full reliance, tawakkul, on the Almighty. Meaning that there is a shield between us and shaitan if we have total reliance on him. The third factor, it creates and foster the spirit of courage and bravery. People became courageous. They become pray, brave when they have total reliance on God because they know that nothing will happen to them as long as God is satisfied with them, as long as they are in compliance with God's order and they rely completely on Him. As the ayah says, قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا هُوَ مَوْلَانَا وَعَلَى اللَّهِ Nothing will happen to us if God doesn't want that. Everything that will take a place should be with His will and with His order. This is the meaning of reliance. And the final fruit of relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the embodiment. It is the verification of our faith. When we claim that we are faithful, how do we put this into demonstration? Is that when we rely on Him, when we have a complete and total reliance and a trust on Him. Now, what about the complacency? Again, do they go hand in hand? Complacency with tawakkul? No. Someone cannot stay at home and say, I have a total dependency and reliance on God and God will bring me my nourishment and my basic needs. God would say you have to go outside and work. The same way as, they, as the great prophets of God has done that. They worked hard and they achieved it and they earned it due to the success and the help of God to them. The the second segment is segment number 44 and the theme is to cultivate love where it says Allahumma inni as'aluka bismika ya habibu ya taribibu ya qaribu ya raqib ya hasibu ya muhibu ya muthibu ya mujibu ya khabiru ya basir it says O oh, the 
beloved, the, the physician, the healer, the nearer, the supervisor, the reckoner to account, the awful re rewarder, acceptor, aware, all seeing. The word, Ya Habibu, Ya Tabib. God is beloved. Now, this road of love is a two way loving and being loved. You have to show the love in order to receive the love. It's, it's, an, it's an environment where both ways should work, an atmosphere that has two ways. As we have said earlier that it is mandatory and naturally accepting that every single one should feel the love toward others and be beloved, be embraced. This is how a natural life is. When you look at those criminals, especially the youngsters, the juveniles, who end up in prison and are inmates, when you look at them, you see that the majority of them, they were deprived from the warm atmosphere of the family, where they could not share and experience love, this feeling. Therefore, they were abandoned. And that will cause imbalance to the personality, disturbance to our daily activities. Love is an integral part of anything. The hadith says um, from the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, أَفَاضِلُكُمْ أَحَاسِنُكُمْ أَخْلَاقًا الْمُوَطَّؤُونَ أَكْنَافَ الَّذِينَ يَأْلِفُونَ the best among you are those who are lenient with people, who can be loved and can love, can integrate in society, and society also will miss them. They will embrace them. They would love them. They will keep them. If they, if they are away, the society will miss them. This is how it is. A man came to Imam al-Sadiq and told him, هل الحب في الدين? Does religion have love? The Imam said, وهل الدين إلا الحب? The whole religion, the whole faith is based on love. God has made this religion so we love each other and have a very warm and good relationship with, other, which, with each other, to have harmonious relationship with each other. The segment number 45, the theme is to dispel fearful dreams, where it says, the nearest of all, the friendliest of all friends, the possessor of a greater insight than all others, most aware of all, the noblest of all nobles, most exalted of all, exalted, the mightiest of all mighty, most independent of all, most generous of all, kindest of all those who are kind. It is where it says, the nearest of all, Ya Aqraba min kulli qareeb. God is a closer thing to us, more than anything else. The Almighty says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوَسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُهِ إِلَيْهِ we are closer to human more than his jugular vein. Look at this jugular vein here. This is how close and important this vein to us, to our life. God is even closer than this jugular vein to us. In another verse, it says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am so close. I can hear them. One day Musa alayhi salam, ask Allah, tells, tells him, Ya Rab, aba'idun anta fa'unadik, am qareebun fa'unajik. Are you far away that I shout when I talk to you, or you are close that I whisper? God tells him, neither one. An jalisu man dhakarani. I am confident. I am the soulmate of whoever mentions me. Maybe he doesn't even use his tongue. 
only in heart he mentions me, I will become his jalis and his confidant. May the Almighty give us the ability, the guidance and power to follow through his commands. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Perform good acts while you are still in the vastness of life. The books are open for recording of actions. Repentance is allowed. The runner away from Allah is being called and the sinner is being given hope of forgiveness. Before the light of the action is put off, time expires, life ends, the door for repentance is closed and angels ascend to the sky. Therefore a man should derive benefit for himself from the living for the dead, from the mortal for the lasting and from the departer for the stair. A man should fear Allah while he is given age to live up to his death and is allowed time to act. A man should control his self by rain and hold it with its bridle. Thus, by the rain, he should prevent it from disobedience towards Allah and by the bridle, he should lead it towards obedience to Allah.